Good day. My name is Enrique Alvarez, and I'm here for another amazing episode of uh, Logistics with Purpose. I'm with my co-host of today, Kevin. Kevin, how are you doing today? Uh, good afternoon. I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, I'm. Uh, we're very excited. I know that you have uh, known this guest for for a few few years, and I actually had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago as well. He seems to be like the ultimate Renaissance man to me, doesn't it? Kevin, what's your take? You know, as I was thinking about this, you know, I've known a tool for, well, and we'll get in that, but I've known him for a long time, 15, 16 years. That's a long time. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see how it's gone from A to Z and we start over again. Amazing. Yes. And I, I, without further, I guess, ado, let me introduce you to a tool there. Entrepreneur, inventor, writer, speaker, president of the Equator Advanced Appliances. Uh, and again, Ernst & Young finalist, internationally acclaimed CEO. They have presence in different countries around the world. And his story is uh, amazing. So we're really looking forward to speaking with you today, Atul. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Enrique. It's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate your invitation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, finally, uh, we, we after many kind of invitations, we were able to kind of... Uh, coordinate our schedule. So we're looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Me too. Well, Atul, as, again, as Enrique said, thank you so much for being here today. And as I was preparing for this discussion today, it kind of takes you back. Uh, it was 2006, 2007, when I first met you, uh, different location, uh, the appliances and the things that you have done over the last 15, 16 years is uh, astonishing and we really look forward to hearing all about it but to get started um tell us about your your childhood your early beginnings um a little bit about yourself well uh that's a little bit of a long story i was born in india and uh, my dad was a naval officer so we uh he was posted from place to place every few years and after a few after six or seven uh, schools. Uh, at the age of 10, my parents sent me to a boarding school and it was a military boarding school. And that's where I learned about, you know, discipline and getting along with different cultures. It was from a different part of India where my family is originally from, which is North India, where we speak one language and have different kind of food. And, you know, when I went to South India, where it's a completely different language where I couldn't read it or understand it. And so I grew up in that environment having to survive I'm, I'm saying it like that, but it's not only me. Many of us were thrust into those situations, but we had to learn to survive within a different culture, even though it was within a different different country. And uh, I grew up with the discipline and, uh, you know, that boarding school military environment gives. And so that was my background. And of course, I went and did my studies. I did my, my business degree and my postgraduate degree. And I got my equivalent of a CPA degree, which is a chartered accountant uh, uh, degree. And so I was a specialist in finance, but broadly it is company law and everything to do with, with companies. You know. So well, and yes, be so. before we deep dive into some of your career and professional career and all the different companies that you have founded, um, is there anything in particular, any story from your early years that kind of shaped the kind of person that you are now? I mean, we all know that you like to invent things. You've always very drawn to like new new machines and things like that. So what what brought all this uh, that was uh, so helpful in your later on in your life? Well, one thing was to always have uh, empathy, you know, to have empathy for others and uh, to understand their problems. And I think uh, uh, growing up, I think in that particular environment, you learn to understand different cultures. So what are the problems I needed the empathy too, because I was growing up in a different culture and I'm also trying to understand how others think and feel if they were thrust into a different situation. If you're in a only one environment in your home environment, then it's very difficult to understand right. that. So I think that gave me an understanding of what it is like to be if I'm on this side and to try to understand people's problems and issues, you know, when I'm on the other side. And that happened more when I finished my school, which is from the military environment, and I went into university and got into university environment in my, uh, then even in my postgraduate studies, I met people from different walks, very hardworking people, but from completely different, they'd not been to boarding school and had that. So I learned to sort of empathize uh, with those situations and understand them. 
you must have had a lot of different role models growing up. Um, anyone in particular and maybe a particular story that want to share with us? Well, uh, of course, uh, today is a very important day. Day It's October 2nd, which is Mahatma Gandhi's birthday uh, today, October 2nd. So he was a role model of doing things in a, making change in a nonviolent way, uh, but doing it very strategically. And he was a role model in the sense he was also CEO. He was CEO of a program to make to make a country independent. But as a CEO, you try and look at those. It's not like he was just, uh, he, he was doing a lot of strategic thinking against uh, uh, an organization, a colonial power much stronger than him or his country without weapons. And so strategically he broke, he, he had to convince the, the people, you know, the British on how, on that he was right, morally right. And so it was, the, the lesson I learned was the negotiation is very important and the tools you learn are very important at how you go about that. It's easy to get angry about something and say, well, this is the way I want it. And we all do that. You know, we all want certain things in a particular way, but you got to get the people on board. You got to get your own team on board. You got to get the people you're negotiating with, whether it's across the board, everybody's dealing with multiple uh, people, whether it's employees or vendors or bankers or whatever, to get them on board your vision. And that's what I really learned about that, to, to really win. There's no way for you to enforce it. And, and and in doing that, you know, you build partnerships along the way when you talk about different organizations, whether it be suppliers, vendors, bankers, you know, they, at some point they all turn into partners. But that's a learned piece of, of advice that's, that, that takes years to figure that out many times. Um, being a, a CEO, an inventor, an entrepreneur and all the different things that you do today, it had to start somewhere. So in your professional journey, Walk us through, if you would, just a little bit, you know, some of the early days as you're out of school, your education is done, you're sitting there, you go, now what do I do? So what were some of those early challenges and some of those early footsteps that you had? Well, you know, it was a different time. I mean, you're going back 40 years and uh, 40 years, the, the environment I grew up in in India, it was an economically challenging time. Uh, there was a lot of people who were studying and jobs were difficult to get. And so many people were looking for jobs anywhere in the world, you know, to go and just, I mean, it's it's one right. thing to say now, I, I want to be happy. And, you know, people talk about that now, but well, in those days, I just needed a job to validate all the education. And I happened to get a job with a British company. And they said, well, the opening is in Africa, not even English speaking Africa, but French speaking Africa. And I said, yes, I'll do it. So that is the situation I fell into and I applied like, applied for the job. They bought me a ticket, I flew to London, where I passed the final interview. And, uh, you know, I was staying in a hole in the wall kind of uh, hotel for a few weeks while they trained me. And then I went to Africa. And wow. as I flew, the same, the same flight that was flying to Africa was delayed. And on the way, there was a coup in the country I was flying to, which is Nigeria. And so you know, we had to deplane and all sorts of things happened. And that was an experience of a whole life of having unexpected things happening to you. So I'm just, it's like, I'm just, uh, just there and, you know, events happen every day and they still happen every day, even though you can wish it for happening a different way, but events happen, you know? And so that gained me a lot of respect for organic growth and you really can't control everything most many people believe you can but actually you cannot control anything it's just there you're going with the flow and then i i lived in africa for seven or eight years for this company i was a field operator uh the company was doing imports and exports and international business exports of agricultural product cashew nut shear nut they had some industrial uh base over there for production they're also importing lots of things like wines and alcohol and um, you know, home consumer products and so on. So I learned about international business, which I'd never gotten into. I was a finance specialist and I grew to love that field. And I said, wow, this is interesting, you know? What uh, What did you like about the um, the business? Well, what kind of, of all the different things that you must have kind of learned throughout that time, what was the one or two things that you actually gravitated towards? Well, I think it was the fascination of being able to go into a country and and 
I operated in seven or eight countries in Africa. And by the time I learned French, and so I was up operating in French and English speaking countries and to figure out what the uh, local population would need, you know, and be able to fulfill that and find it in some part of the world and deliver it there and provide a service. Obviously, it's a business and you're earning profit as well. Right. But that was, I learned to develop a formula on how to international documentation. Those days, they still had telexes. This is even before fax machines, you know. So communication was difficult. It was expensive. How do you communicate, uh, you know, with different languages, different countries across the globe? How do you find suppliers? There was no internet at uh, that time. Right. Uh, so it was, it, it you you learn, and we learned and we, we, then there was international documentation, you know, uh, you had letters of credit and so on. There was a whole gamut of new experiences that I had to go through. And I, I began to like that. So even though my special specialty was in finance and I was the finance manager of a company, but then I grew to be the country manager looking over all the other operations and then a regional manager of across many countries, you know? So uh, I, I guess... Uh, I, I learned that skill, you know, and I began to enjoy that skill. Well, very successful career. You started in Nigeria. Can you tell us which other African countries you you had the pleasure of living in? The first country actually was Ivory Coast, now called Cote d'Ivoire, French country. And I was on the way there when there was a coup in Nigeria. So that was, a, ah. and there was actually, a. Uh, so that was the first one. Then I went to Togo, also French, then to Benin, also French. Then I went to Cameroon, Burkina Faso, all French. And uh, the English speaking countries were Nigeria and Ghana. You know, wow. so the way, the way uh, let's say, uh, when, when you had the British and French came in, they each had their piece of country. So almost every alternate country was spoke a different language. You cross through borders and they'd be speaking different languages, you know. Well, and at what point in that kind of career did you realize that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I mean, you've always clearly been an entrepreneur one way or the other, but at what point was it a little bit more evident to you that you were going to start a company? Well, actually, I was a very loyal employee to the company. And uh, I mean, they were they treated me very well. I, I grew to uh, became very fond of the top management and, they, and, and we were dealing with large sums of money in which as a finance person, I, I control. So... I had no intention of uh, leaving of leaving that, but as the company grew and the and the demands uh, the demands grew, the risks taken were greater, and the amount right. and you know and uh, the chairman was in London, and he was making decisions and many times he overruled some of the decisions some of the field people gave like myself and some others, and for example we told him in Nigeria there was going to be a coup well yet another coup and Nigeria was the biggest operations. And he said, well, he contacted some of the people he knew and he said, no, there's going to be no, no coup and nothing's going to happen. But there was a coup. And as a result of that, the, the, the currency was devalued by 50%. And you know, if your company loses half its value overnight, it's very difficult to operate and pay your bills. And that was the beginning of the decline. And so the company started you know, winding down operations. It, it, it was the death knell for it took a few years. But the writing was on the wall that could not continue. And so everybody had to look for something new. And so that's the first the first lesson I really learned was, you know, that I wasn't yet in the entrepreneur that I felt very bad. And many other people also that we had invested many years, but, but the boss didn't listen to us and see what happened. And if he had listened to us, the company would have been saved. And, you know, so... And that's one of the things I try to follow in my own company now as an entrepreneur is to listen to the person closest to the action, you know, um, talking to customers and so on. So I, so anyway, so then it crashed. And then I was back to zero with nothing after seven or eight years. Wow. I had a house in London. I couldn't pay the mortgage. I lost it. I lost my car. I have everything. And like all immigrants came to America with 10 bucks in my pocket. Wow, for that's a my, that's an incredible for, story. That's amazing. For, my, for the next round now. Right. And well, and the next round it was, right? I believe um Equator. Tell us a little bit when you jumped into Equator Advanced Appliances. I think it was founded in 1991. That's Tell right. us a little bit more about that those years. Why why Equator? Why the uh industry that you picked? What kind of really was your intention back there, back then? 
Well, you know, the time I arrived in 1991, that was in the middle of the the uh, the Kuwait War. Uh, you know, that was it wasn't right. a good time. And anytime there's a war, there's a lot of stress. Even now, you see with Ukraine and so on, it's a stress on the domestic situation and finances, finances, and so on. So it was somewhat of a recession at that time, and I went to apply for jobs. You know, and said, uh, and they said, well, have you? being educated in America? And I said, no. And they said, have you had American experience? And I said, no. They said, so what do you know? And I said, well, I worked in London, worked in Africa. I've met these, these are the kind of deals I did with governments and, you know, and, um, you know, now, I, but there was, there was no job to fit that. You know, they said there's nothing exactly to fit it. I mean, it's very right. structured, you know? So after trying for a few months, maybe six months, I said, well, uh, I know, I know something. <laughs> the, I decided to become an entrepreneur, set up my company, uh, import export company, which is the skill I had learned. And since I didn't, you know, I didn't have the U.S. Uh, qualifications, and by then I had started a family, and so there was some pressure. It's not like well, of course. you can roll the years back. So uh, I, I started Equator, which is basically trading from one country to another, north to south, you know, of the Equator. From you know, that's what it started off as an import export country. Ironically, one of the first things I did was business with Mexico. At that time, NAFTA was being passed. And I had oh, wow. a bunch of people from Mexico and I organized a conference, a, U a, you know, a UN-sponsored conference. And so within my first year of getting to coming to Houston, I knew a lot of people and I started operating on you know, some of those deals. So it started off uh, that way. It wasn't, of course, uh, sufficient to sustain itself because you're looking for deals all the time and relationships it takes time to build relationships. You cannot do a deal and say you have a relationship. And so right, um, right. I was always trying to find some product, uh, you know, that I could fall into, you know. And which one was your first one? What was your first invention, uh, or at least the one that went out into the market? Well, you know, so I had lived, when I lived in Africa, we had a beautiful house on the beach as the, you know, right act, actually on the ocean. And so every weekend or many times a week, we'd go swimming in the beach. But here we missed that. So I told my wife, let's go to the beach every Sunday. And she says, we can't because I got, I got to do laundry. And I said, you know, what kind of a life is it? You work all week, you know, and then you're doing laundry on weekends. So in London, in the house that we had, we had a washing machine that washed and dried in the same unit. Oh. So I said, well, why don't we get one of those that we'll buy it for our our apartment we're living in a rented apartment and uh you know just throw your clothes in it will do your laundry so we went to sears in those days and montgomery ward and uh they said nothing like this exists you're imagining it, you wow. know so we said and then it clicked i said well here's something we need and if and if we need i'm sure some other people need it and here is a product that we clearly know it's needed and it's not there so here's an opportunity but you, you need, I didn't know about appliances. I didn't know where to get it from. I didn't know, you know, uh, the, what the safety requirements are. Needless to say, I was still operating on a shoestring budget and it needs money for operations. So I flew to Europe and uh, went back to some stores in UK and found out. Then I went to a trade show. Uh, I found, you know, I found a small company willing to make it for us. And uh, after some tests and so on, they produced it, sent the prototype. By then I'd learned the system and got a whole bunch of credit cards over here, you know, got secured credit cards for $200 and then increased it to 300, 500, 1000, wow. then got few thousands. So by that time, a year, year and a half passed when all this process was going on and the machine was ready, they said, okay, pay for your first container. I went and cashed out all my credit cards, got $25,000 and paid for it and bought the first container. Wow. And then for and then I went to the where they went to some warehouses, third party logistics companies here and said, I got the container coming, but I don't have any more money. I want you to store it for me. And can you ship it out to the customer? When I get paid, then I'll pay you and you know, you've got the whole thing. And that's the whole thing with relationships. People got to trust you. Right. You know, and I think uh, people's that's why I, start, I talk about people ask, Are you good for the money? And you say, I'm good. And that's like a promise. It's like you swore that you're going to fulfill it. So, so this all started with a washing machine and a dryer that does it together at the same point and same time. Um, what happened to that washing machine and dryer? Do you still have one? 
I still have one. Well, right now, that is our core product. That's what our company is known for. Just like Singer is known for the sewing machines they made. Right. Now they made, make other widgets, you know. But that's our core product, even though we have many product lines. And we are on our 14th, 14th generation of machine or edition of machine with improvements, uh, you know, over the course of almost, let's say, 32 years now, you know, with improvements and keeping along with the regulations and new innovations and electronics and so on that have come our way. And, and you talked about other product lines. Uh, how has that evolved over the last, since 91, whatever that would be? How, what, tell us about your other product lines. What has, How have you evolved from a washer and a dryer in, at the beach to all these years later? Well, you know, uh, I continue my my thought process is still on washing machines, and that's what I dream about. Uh, you know, how do you improve pump performance and valve performance and drainage and less water and less power and so on. But it when when actually you're running a business, if I'm if I'm an inventor sitting in a in a lab, then I'm an inventor, and then somebody else is doing the marketing of it, and then I'm not concerned with the effects of those things. Somebody else is doing that. But when you're an entrepreneur, if I quickly learned that you got to do everything yourself and you got to make it happen. So you got to conceive the product, you got to invent the product, you got to produce the product, pay for the product, market it. And so when I went to meet, say, Montgomery Ward, for example, I had a meeting with them for six hours. We hit it off. And the guy says, you know, I have people come from Whirlpool and big companies and I give them two hours and I'm spending six hours with you, <laughs> you know. And you're here to sell one product. He says, you're a nice guy, but you're going to come up with some more products. I can't, it's too much of my time that's going. So I was forced. I said, okay, now, now I got it. To be a business, you got to think differently. You got to think what they want also. And so I produce a whole bunch of products, which are profitable products, because you know we like to make good products with what you call form and function. It must look good and it must work well. So every single product we have, and we have competitors, it's not like, it's an open market. We go into right. a dishwasher, you have 100 companies out there. How can we be better? So we study all the features and how can we have two or three different uh, you know, uh, innovations? What is the problem in that? And it becomes a little bit clear because once you're coming from outside, it becomes clear what the problem is from a customer point of view. And the customer says, I want to make it easier. I don't want to you know, cut down the number of steps. I want to combine functions. I cannot have 10 appliances sitting on my counter, for example, and uh, things like that. So once that gets in, then that's how we innovate. And uh, so we have dishwashers, refrigerators, freezers, wine refrigerators, uh, dishwashers, you know, this everything, uh, microwaves, microwaves that, uh, you know, the two in one, three in one. We have uh, air conditioners, uh, outdoor air conditioners, indoor air conditioners. Uh, you know, so lots of things uh, that uh, the, the need creates the solution. Uh, you know, so we like to say we're a, uh, we're a, uh, we we make problem solving appliances. If it doesn't solve a problem, like it. then we're not in it. You know, what's problem, the problem solving appliances? Solve? Yeah. Well, and, and today you're a global company and uh, you're worldwide and you're even to a different extent than that. Uh, you're out of this world. And, and and what I mean by that is tell us about your experience and, and what Equator has done with, um, you know, NASA's manned mission to Mars. Obviously, this is something that uh, uh, is a differentiator for Equator and, and everybody else that's out there. Well, you know, as we've been become better in our, in our uh, work and the products we make, uh, we've been successful at it. We've been going international with going to Canada, going going to India, going to the Middle East. We set up operations in Europe now where we're in three or four uh, countries and understanding the issues that they're facing and customizing them. But, you know, we've recently started working with NASA. Actually, NASA has been testing a machine of ours since the last 20 plus years, you know, and we re recently contacted them. We sold, we sold a machine to Lockheed Martin about 20 years ago. And, but, you know, they never had the Artemis program until recently. So they've been testing it, knowing eventually they'll get there, but budgetary issues and so on, they were not proceeding with that. But recently it's, it's taken a push. And uh, so we re-engaged with NASA and uh, we're, uh, you know, we've identified many different uh, you know, issues that we need to resolve. 
uh, in the machine, which is going to drive innovation, uh, whether it's power or water or the weight of the machine, which concerns logistics, because every pound of additional weight, you know, adds to the cost of shipping something to the moon. So the project that uh, NASA has is to build a house on the moon, uh, almost like an RV or a tiny house, where uh, four astronauts are going to live there for six months to a year. And for their physical health and their mental health, they need to, people have to be clean. They need to be in a, like a home-like environment right. to do the job. I mean, laundry is something you got to do, but the main job is scientific experiments and the other things that they do. And the last thing you want is people, you know, having some health issues and worrying about contamination. Where did the water come from? Uh, worrying about microfibers. There are things like, uh, you know, moon dust, which is sharp uh, like glass. What happens if it gets into the water system? What happens to the body? Uh, it should be easy to repair. You know, so there are multiple issues, and if we can resolve some of these, then it will help the products that we have on Earth. The The criteria they have given us is to reduce water consumption by 75%. Now, wow. that's a huge reduction. And what is what are the implications of the problems we are facing on Earth here? So uh, it will certainly drive innovation uh, in our company, and that gives us a worthy goal after these number of years. Well, Atul, so, congratulations for that. Yeah, that's amazing. And very few companies can say that they're actually working hand in hand with NASA to get uh, the washer dryer into the moon. So that's, we'll definitely have to circle back with you once that project uh, is on its way. But thank you so much for sharing. And once again, congratulations. Speaking of innovation, and I know that you're very keen about innovation. You're also part of your core beliefs is uh, sustainability. And it's making sure that we don't have a footprint into this world. Could you tell us a little bit more about why that's important to you and why you think this is important for everyone else in, in your industry and really in every other industry? Well, I think it's very clear that, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to um, reduce consumption and reduce waste. We're in the forefront uh well, we were the first company uh, uh, to to first uh, first front loading washing machine to be sold in the U.S. And at that time, we didn't know they were energy saving and water saving. The front loading machines use one quarter the amount of water than that of a top loading machine. So that's the water, and because they only have to heat quarter the amount of water, they use quarter the amount of energy to heat the water. So overall, it's much better. And we fell into this, and of course, that became the point, and we were a charter member of the Energy Star program, and, you know, they were testing our machine to establish the standards way back in 1995 or something like that. You were then, the first company, right? I mean, you were the first company we, to be awarded the uh, Energy Star. We were the first uh, first washing machine, say. They had, washing machine they had computer programs and so on, but of the course. appliance program, or maybe washing machine program, we were the first, you know. So... Uh, so we've worked with them and, you know, now, of course, it's become very crowded and it's uh, established, but we've always felt it. And we are, we're also learning along the way. The the knowledge that we have today is certainly much more than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And the awareness right. we have of the environment. And so we've also learned and said, well, it's very important for us to, to save the earth. I, did, I think something came out just today that the earth's temperature has gone up by one and a half degrees over the last uh, last hundred years, and that's causing a lot of changes. And you know, and I think we, as a as a manufacturer, have to design products that take these into account. Uh, you know, I mean, there are now washing machines are involved with, you know, um, let's say microplastics, and you know, we have clothes that are shedding water and do well. We say we make the washing machine. What role do we have? But is it the water temperature? Is it the the toss and tumble of the of the of the drum that can cause it, and if so, we need to do something about it. So that's the kind of problem we get into and try to solve. And I'm just giving theoretically because we haven't solved it. It's an industry problem, but uh, we have to be conscious about these things. Uh, you know, um, absolutely. I, I think it's much more than earning profits. I'll give you an example. We just don't sell gas products. So we are like the Tesla of of appliances. Gas now, California has has banned the use of gas in multifamily homes, New York as well, because they found recently just that, that gas has got uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, you know, when so for the cook, as they're cooking, these are the 
emissions from there. So why would you, why would we want to sell right. such a product? And so, um, you know, so, so that's the kind of thing uh, we are. I mean, it's like saying there was a time when smoking was not considered healthy, but then they found out it was not healthy. So then, you know, you, you learn that. So we've, since we know this about gas, so, uh, so we're, we're very conscious about uh, the, Absolutely. The, the things going on. You know, throughout this whole conversation so far, we've it's been about the journey. It's been about innovation. It's been about different ways of thinking. And for you, and early on in your career, it was survival. And um, so at some point, you decided to put this to pen and paper. And uh, in your book, Underdog Thinking, um, tell us what motivated you. What were some of the, the ideas that you wanted to put down in writing that were so important that uh, what motivated you to do this? And, and when did you do this? Well, I did it a few years ago. Uh, the idea was many years in the making because first of all, it's a very exciting being an entrepreneur. You have, uh, you, being an entrepreneur is, is for any entrepreneur, I would say you conceptualize an idea and you have to convey this and convey, convince people that it makes sense and make it make it profitable. But then I went through some experiences, you know, which you can say, uh, you know, uh, with, with the recall in our company of the products, uh, you know, and then we had to go through a very rough time and reconstitute the company. And the learnings that I learned, the management theories that I that I came up with and how to make a new equator. So actually, Kevin, I know you from the old equator when equator was at the top of our of our, uh, you could say the pinnacle of our accomplishments, where we had a huge headquarters, we owned big building, we had eight distribution centers around around the country and in Canada, and we were really running running it great, and we had different goals. And after we went through this experience, when we had quality problems and so on, and we had very upset customers, it led to a re, re evaluation of what is it we're really trying to do. Is the is the is is it really important just to grow, and what is it you gain by growing? I mean, does it really give you satisfaction? Yes, it's numbers, but do you really double your your quality of life, or what do you do? It led to that kind of soul searching, and I decided to when I first of all, most entrepreneurs don't get a second chance. Right, it's it, you you get one shot, and ninety percent of entrepreneurs fail. That's it. You had your shot and. You know that that's what it is. Few decide to come back, and I said maybe I'm going to give it another shot. You know, and the only way through come out, coming out of depression and uh, bad thoughts going through your head is to conquer the very thing that beat you. And I said, you know what? I'm going to come up with the best machine over there. I want to make the only goal I'm going to have is make customers happy. It doesn't matter about the growth, how big the company is. I want every customer who buys a product from this company to be happy. Because when I had the recall, there were upset customers right. and they were suing us and you know saying, all. and I said, why did I become an entrepreneur? So this is my goal now to innovate, innovate and make products that bring joy, bring happiness, that improve people's quality of life. You know, and that's all it is. And it doesn't matter what the volume is. Each customer is so important they should be happy one at a time. Wow. And that's kind of what the book talks about, right? Your, your kind of a story and how you defeated the odds and how you came back. And that's why I'm guessing it's also um, titled Underdog Thinking. Yes. Yeah, so the story is about the start of the company, how it went up and some of the things that happened, uh, you know, intentional or non-intentional, uh, you know, and, uh, the sequence and how I rebuilt it back. And actually it is for this, it's a story for entrepreneurs and for anybody else, for anybody who's not an entrepreneur to think what entrepreneurs go through. And most entrepreneurs I have met have gone through something similar, that they have gone through some uh, catastrophic event in whatever they, mine was pretty catastrophic. So some may have more or less. And what I did to bring it back you know, and ultimately how I had to repurpose my life and change my life and what I wanted and what I wanted to do. So that's the story. And it's, uh, you know, for people who are not entrepreneurs and also for entrepreneurs to show them that there is a greater purpose, actually, you know, to just uh, don't give up because uh, it can be done. 
it's difficult actually, because when you go down, your credit is shot. You don't have any money. You're everybody's saying, what did you do to me? You, you have problems even in your family who's saying, hey, what's, what's going on over here? So it's, it's tough. And um, so I, I, I hope, I mean, I hope it's been useful to people who read it. Well, you've given presentations to, to people all over the world, different entrepreneurs, um, industry executives, uh, to MBA students, people at your, at your alma mater as well. And so with all the learning that you have gone through, the, the successes and the failures that have helped you become what you are today, when you present and you talk to, the, to, to people, what's, what are some of the main questions that you get that, uh, mm -hmm. that makes a difference in someone else's life as they go down this entrepreneurial uh, road that you've been down? Well, I think the number one thing is to focus on your customer, you know? I mean, if you just focus on your customer, uh, you know, people ask all sorts of questions. Oh, how can I make money? And I tell them, if that's your only, your only goal, then you're not going to get there because that's a very shallow goal. Money is a consequence of success and if you deserve it, you know? And clearly, we, we, we in the consumer products uh, industry, is we are, we are right on the edge dealing with consumers. And now... It's even more with social media and so on. So I give, I tell customers, it's a long, long, I, I tell people who listen and talk to students and so on, it's a long road to do doing that. But the satisfaction you get from making your customers happy of is, is immense, you know? And many people say, well, can I get a job then? You know, we'd love to work with you. So I think that is a validation that <laughs> that it's making some some difference. Doing the right things right makes a really, it makes a big difference. Uh, and the way the approach that people perceive you, your organization, and then those people that you work with as well. So, right. you know, I, I guess the last one of the things I have is is advice to these people that you talk to, other than focus on the customer, um, other than reading your book. Of course, that's always a great piece of uh, advice. What's something else you would advise them other than as as they're sitting in that chair trying to figure out what do I want to do? Yes, focusing on the customer is critical. How do you do that? What What is one of the first steps that you do? Well, I think the answer is that you have to keep looking for it until it comes. And if you have to do it organically, you know, if you're looking for an idea, the idea will come just like I got the idea and I became, I learned to become good at it, you know, uh, and I learned, I learned and, and, and the secret is to have empathy for the people. I go back to that first point. I empathize with the people at the end of the day, you know, appliances are used mostly by women, except men like to barbecue, but most of the appliances are used by women, whether it's washing machines or dishwashers and so on. And what we're doing is helping making life easier. In many of the developing countries we're working with, we are saving an enormous amount of time for the women so they can free up their time to have better quality of life with their families and so on. So I look at it almost like a service that I'm doing. You know, that's a, I mean, uh, that, that you're helping improve people's quality of life. So it's more than, more than just, uh, than just, uh, just a calling. Now, it didn't start off like that. It started off trying to set up a business, earn a living, then got into innovation. So this is, I'm actually in Equator. This is the third phase, the new Equator. You know, the first phase was importing, just selling a product that I could sell. The second one was actually setting up manufacturing and so on and then crashing from that. And the third one is the new equator where we understand how do we improve people's lives. So I just tell people that try to find your calling. What is your calling? And it will, it will find you, you know, but money shouldn't, trying to say, I just want to earn more money shouldn't be one of them. But be careful what um, you ask for. Someday you may just get it, right? <laughs> yes, why not? That will also well, be and, and as you said, right, money is always a, a, a the out the product of some of the decisions that you make in life, like how you work in life and your approach to life. So no, I totally agree and very powerful, very powerful words, great recommendations for our listeners. It seems to me, Atul, that you've always had a really good pulse on the market itself. You you understand the trends, you understand what people's needing, you understand that some things are important. Um, so my question to you is, uh, how do you, what are the main indicators that you keep track of and how, how do you have such a good pulse on what the consumers or the trends 
are dictating. And then uh, as a follow-up question, once you realize what the changes are going to be, then how do you turn around and then adopt it so quickly in your company? Because again, I mean, you've you've restarted many, many times. You readjusted to the new equator as you just brought it up. What's the trick? How can you change so quickly to keep um, keep innovating? Well, I think the first thing is to find the opportunity, you know, and uh, I'll give you some examples. I mean, uh, COVID was a, was a time, it, it came upon us and it was a very challenging time, whether for consumer products or people at home or logistics or everybody that was trying to figure it out. And uh, there was in in the manufacturing side, there was a chip supply. There were plants shutting down because their workers had COVID, you know. So it was a very challenging time. But we had to see it through and say, okay, if people have COVID, what do we what do we do? And we got to sort of segment your your short term goals and your long term goals, you know. So the short term goal is well, COVID is here. How do we do it? People are concerned about their lives, about their health and safety, wellness. And what can we do? So we, first of all, we set up, made sure that our plants were up and running. We supported them in some cases with financial support and investing in things like chips, made sure that their workers were, all the workers were okay. The production could, you know, could, it may not be as smooth as it was, but it could take place in every alternate month or whatever. Nick and the logistics, as you know, was a very challenging time where right. the freight rates went up by, seven foot seven times ten times and so we had to accept all those uh things and uh but as a result our washing machines came up with the sanitized function allergen function antimicrobial features which were embraced by customers and so we were rewarded in that by thinking about the customers and their concerns you know we sense. sell a lot to the rv uh rv space and people go to the common uh you know uh, in the common the common uh, areas for laundry, and um, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to have the washing machine in their own uh, space, their own RV. So we we came up with these machines. It was a great success. We came up with many other products. Another example is the outdoor line that uh, we came up with. People were entertaining, and uh, we we have a social need. So you're not entertaining indoors because you're concerned about catching right. an infection. And so we came up with a whole outdoor line, outdoor air conditioners, outdoor refrigerators. So the need created the opportunity. And I think it is a question of trying to figure out anytime there's a problem, what's our solution in the field we, we operate in? So the field we operate in is, you know, appliances. So as an example, we came up with air purifiers and, you know, the washing machines and four or five products in that segment. And then in the outdoor segment, and they've all done very well, you know. Even though COVID has has um, has gone to some extent, but I think it's here to stay. And people have a much different awareness of these things, uh, the risks to life now. So, Absolutely. and I'm happy we're 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 able to contribute and find solutions for people's, uh, you know, where, where they're doing it. Well, COVID has changed as an example. It's changed the way we do business today as we're doing podcasts and, and uh, meetings yep. as we're doing today. So, um, you know, as we continue to talk about logistics and, and with purpose, you know, it's an honor to work with you, uh, the entire team that you have that uh, you've assembled uh, and, and working with you and your team day to day. Uh, obviously, you have a, a passion for what you do um, and then working with your employees as well. What does logistics with purpose, what does that mean to you uh, today and then even in the future as we continue to evolve? Well, logistics is a very uh, important part, part, part of the whole process, because, you know, we, as I mentioned, we are, we're in the consumer space, consumer product space, and we're dealing directly with consumers as opposed to, say, business to business, which is more, okay, something happens and replace the product and you're dealing with one person. Dealing with consumers, you're dealing with social media and blogs and people can, nowadays people, customers, consumers, have a simple goal that if we decide to buy a product at the click of a button, it should be delivered here in the shortest possible time in say good condition, it should work. 
I mean, I paid for it. I have a right that it should work. So there's a lot of pressure on all fronts. The machine should work. We need to move it, uh, ship it from one part of the world to another safely on time because many people's livelihoods are depending on it. So, for example, our distributors depend on us having products in time. Our retailers us depend on us. They don't depend only on us, but let's say they depend on many people to supply them on time. The consumer, if they order a product and you say it's not in stock, they'll say, what do you mean it's not in stock? You're supposed to know whether you have it in stock. Right. So all this is connected to logistics. You know, how do we move it safely, without damage, on time, and deliver it, you know, to the customer so they're happy? And frankly speaking, it's a big challenge, a lot of these uh, spaces, because you have the, the, these, these topics, because you've got damage issues and uh, you know, lots of things happening, you know, not specifically the international, but the whole chain of logistics is is involved in this, uh, you know, and now people want it installed in their home and, you know, uh, take away the old product and we're dealing with labor shortage and all these things. So the entire, all this gamut of logistics is a ever evolving situation and challenging situation. And what I love about working with Equator is that we've taken out the the vendor supplier relationship that that's been gone for a long time working with with Equator. It truly is a partnership and it's the way you work with people and your associates, your employees, um, whether it's at your level working with suppliers and and everyone else in the supply chain. Uh, you do it with with honesty and integrity and you keep your values and your principles in check good things happen to good people. So it, it's an honor, again, to uh, work with you, um, the, the folks on your team as well. Um, as, as we wrap up here the next couple of minutes, uh, how can our listeners connect with you and, and, of course, learn more about Equator Advanced Appliances? And how's the best way for them to better understand what you do professionally and, and then also about how, what the journey that that's gotten you here as well? Thank you. Well, Thank you for your, for this uh, this uh, opportunity to talk. Uh, it's an honor. I think I, we value the relationship, and relationships are the most important thing in any business. You know, not just the numbers, but the best way to learn about our company and our products is to look on our website, which is equatoropplances.com. And the best way to reach me, well, on the company website, there is a contact page with a direct link to me and anybody can send me an email from there. Or I also have a personal website, which is atollbeer.com. And they can reach me there. And this is about the presentations I do. And uh, that's part of the uh, giving back that I do that I hope somebody will benefit from this. And uh, it will be useful to somebody's life and having a successful and happy life and fulfilling life. Atul, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for being here today. It's been a pleasure. It's great knowing you and your family and your wife. So uh, thank you once again for being such a great example for a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners out there and for everyone out there that's trying to work hard and make a positive impact in this world. To everyone else that's listening to this episode, and if you like conversations like the one we just had with Atul, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. 